Hi, I'm David Austin Gray. Uh, I'm a pianist and composer uh, from Birmingham. Uh, and I've been invited here uh, by Jazz Lines to do a masterclass on uh, composition. So um, hopefully we're going to be able to help you if you're uh, writing something at home, whether you're brand new to writing or you're already quite experienced, to show you a few ways to kind of uh, navigate through that process of taking that idea from your head and uh, sort of getting it down on the paper or just coming up with something a bit more solid and concrete. Uh, just a few ways to develop your compositional ideas. Um, so yeah, I'm also joined by Zosa Cole. Hi everyone, my name's Zosa Cole. I'm a saxophonist and a flautist. Um, and I've been you know, with the Jazz Lines family since they started in 2012 um, at the summer schools and the various ensemble um, you know, vibe things that we've had going. Uh, you know, it's going to be great to write some music today. And, and one thing that I've always found is writing with someone else to bounce ideas off is always a really useful tool. So we're kind of just going to get into the flow of it and try and come up with something and explain the process of how we get from A to B. So It's important to understand, especially with composition, that there isn't a, there's no such thing as, as right and wrong. It really is just down to taste and intention. You know, if you've got an idea or some intention about what you want to do, just trying to find ways to get the most out of that idea and, and to present it in as authentic a way as is possible. But um, you know what what is great for someone might not be great for someone else. Um, it's just kind of like how you feel about it, really. So yeah, that's kind of one thing that I want to stress that there isn't a a right or a wrong. It's just kind of choices and ideas. So with that. Um, yeah, well, we'll start from the, the, the top, I guess. Um, I was speaking to Zosa about this um, uh, yesterday um, and talking about this analogy of a composition kind of being like um, a painting or like an artwork um, where you start off with a blank canvas and you have an idea perhaps in your head about what you think it might end up looking like maybe what sort of colors you want to use, maybe what sort of shape uh, you want the overall piece to be, but it's when you kind of get into the detail and kind of trial and error that it really starts to take form. So um, with that, if we think about the idea as being this canvas, um, this empty canvas, and then maybe want to think about like the, the mood of the piece that we're trying to create, um, things like the instrumentation and the tonality, Obviously, in this particular case, we've, our instrumentation is, is the piano and the saxophone. Um, obviously, we can do various things with both of those instruments, but those things will probably naturally come about as we kind of work through, work through the, um, the ideas. Um, and then we've got things like you know, your, your chord sequences, your bass lines, your melodic ideas, little small cells of information. Um, I guess the important thing is not to try and do too much too early on. Maybe just take a very simple thing and start from that and see where it, see where it leads you. Yeah, yeah so, D so Dave charged me with the task of coming up with some basic you know, unit of information or a basic melody um, <coughs> to start the composition with. And I was actually, for, for, for my video I was doing, I'm going to be doing later, I came across this uh, Winter Marsalis video where he said, one melody is worth a thousand scales. And that's so true because our scales can be our building blocks and they can give us an idea about where we want to go. But really, a melody has got a strong sense of identity and can really represent us. Um, so I kind of just had to fiddle around with the saxophone, spent about 5, 10, 15 minutes picking and choosing notes. Doesn't have to be perfect, but if you like the sound of it, just go with it. So this was a melody that I came up with. time and if you can try and find out those notes on your instrument that would be great as well because you can see what we're doing with it cool yeah one more time yeah yeah I 
like that. It's nice. Mm. Um, so, yeah, that's um, a little melody that we've come up with. You could easily do the same thing. It could be less notes. It could just be a three-note melody. Uh, it could be a ten-note melody. Um, it could have repetition in there. We didn't have any um, repetition in that. Um, yeah, there are no repeated notes in that melody, were there? No. It's all no. through. So, but you could choose to maybe repeat a note two or three times. Um, obviously, as of yet, we haven't kind of assigned any kind of rhythm to that or like time length or anything like that. Um, we just kind of played it in a range where we were trying to find the notes. Um, so I played it in the middle of the piano, but obviously I could play that an octave higher. Um, or use the whole range of the, of the keyboard and, and likewise with, with Zosa, I can kind of take that um, and play it in different ranges. Um, but yeah, so we spoke a little bit about the melody and Zosa came out with a seven note melody, um, which was really beautiful. Uh, there wasn't any repetition in there, so we just kind of moved from note to note. Um, I'm gonna talk a little bit about the, the range of that melody and the intervals which um, that melody consisted of. Um, and I think Zosa will maybe wants to talk a little bit about the melody as well. Mm -hmm. um, so we'll just kind of look at that, about what melody means. And as I mentioned before, um, it's, it doesn't have to be a complicated melody. Uh, three notes is just as valuable as 10 notes or 15 notes. It's kind of how you use them and the kind of intention behind it uh, and how you can manipulate that material to, to get the most out of it. Um, so yeah, in this next section, we're going to talk about the melody to begin with, then harmony, rhythm, and structure. And I think that those, for the most part, are probably the four main kind of building blocks of the majority of any sort of, uh, any type of composition that you might be creating. There's obviously more elements than that, um, and then there's kind of nuances, and you can get deeper into different aspects of it, but from a kind of basic perspective, you're kind of dealing with your melody, uh, your harmony, uh, your rhythm and the structure of the overall piece, and that's what's going to give you essentially your composition, or at least the this, this skeleton kind of form of your composition. Mm -hmm. So, um, do, do you want to talk a little bit about the, the shape of the melody? Yeah, the definitely. A? I think um, it can be obviously very daunting. I always find it personally very daunting coming to composition because there's so many options. You've obviously got 12 notes per octave, but there's you know so many scales to choose from, so many different variations and stuff and I think the, the the best thing to do is as we say break it down to the basics and particular options you can do with it so one way to look at this melody is the contour we've got boom ba da 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 so it's kind of following this shape that we can kind of all resonate with the rising and falling kind of a wave and you can think even as basically as that um, about the contour and then we can take that same melody but play the notes in reverse so that's going to sound like this we can switch up the order of the notes that we use. And really just experiment with different ways of, of approaching that melody. So you could take your small group of notes, three notes, five notes, seven notes in this case. Um, so a couple of the options that we've got is what we call retrograde, where we play the notes backwards, basically. Um, we've got inversion where we flip the notes upside down. So what was at the bottom, we now put at the top. And we can also play with what octave we play the notes. So for example, I can play what is my, uh, or what's concert C very low, and what's concert A flat very high. One more time and hopefully the sound comes out this time. So there's lots of different options there, and this is all just to do with our melody. We're just trying to take it apart, put this there, put that there, and just experiment with it. A lot of the process of composition is exploration. How are we going to take this basic unit and, and morph it and shape it? And the next thing we're going to talk about is framing that melody. So we've got this single line, and now we're going to put other notes around it to give it some harmony. Yeah, awesome. Um, thanks, Osa. So yeah, I, when Zosa was talking about the shape of the melody, that automatically, um, straight away, started giving me ideas about different aspects of the composition that we can find just from, from using those seven notes. Um, 
that last little um, phrase that you played where you kind of uh, altered the um, the octaves of the notes that you're playing. So, to me, that kind of felt like that could easily be a bass line, for example. Mm. So can you play that last one again? Yeah, maybe? well, I can try. Well, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Great. Mm. So that's just, you know, it's a little example, but you could take that and that automatically, without having to add in additional information, without having to write more music, you've got something which could form part of your composition. So you could have a bass line. If, you've got a, if you're writing for a band, that could be what your bass player is playing. If it's writing for your solo instrument, if it's piano, that could be what your left hand's doing. Or if it's a you know, solo sax or melody instrument, then you can use that as like a riff or a vamp or something like that. Uh, again, Zosa also mentioned about altering the order of the notes, so keeping the, the same notes but changing the order that they're played in. That, to me, kind of all straight away gives me some idea about how I could introduce improvisation into the actual compositional aspect mm -hmm. of the piece. So maybe there might be a section throughout the composition whereby it's set aside for improvisation. And without, again, without having to kind of think about a ton of different scales and harmonies and stuff like that, just using that information, you've got notes to play around with for your improvisation. Mm -hmm. So let's just give you a little example of that, I guess. We'll kind of try here and just to see, see what works. And I think that composition is really is so much about trial and error and experimentation. So um, what I'm gonna do, and this will kind of lead us on to, to harmony quite nicely as well, hopefully. I'm gonna play uh, some accompanying chords, and these chords are only gonna be based off of the, the notes which are on our melody. So I'm not mm. gonna add in additional harmony and changes and stuff like that. I'm just gonna take the notes from the melody and use that as like a kind of pad to support Zosa. And Zosa, if you'd be up for mm -hmm. perhaps just improvising around the melody, using the melody mm. notes and just seeing how that sounds. Should we try and use that bomb? Do do as a bass line. Yeah. Do do do. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> So there you go, straight away. It's obviously, it's not fully realized. I wouldn't necessarily call that a composition it's a in its own right. It's a bit rough around the ideas, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> around the ideas, but yeah. um, it's certainly something. Certainly could be an introduction, mm. a vamp, maybe a way of bridging uh, two different sections together. Mm -hmm. So, you know, that's, it's just things to try around with, and hopefully that's going to give you that confidence to take your idea, no matter how developed or simple um, that idea is, and feel that there's more kind of, um, sort of more potential in that idea than you may realize, basically. It's got a bit more legs than, than you think it might have, you know, just from a few notes. So. I think it's also good that it's rough, there's an element of rough and ready to it, because mm -hmm. one of the pressures is that you want every composition and every piece that you play to immediately be a masterpiece. Now we're just, this is like, you know, it's like gold mining or, you know, diamond mining or whatever. Uh, oftentimes there's a lot of rocks that you've got to kind of get through and the bits that don't look so great. But in there somewhere is this, you know, diamond ready to kind of be, you know, polished and probably be worth quite a lot. So yeah, yeah. don't worry about things sounding a bit sketchy, you know, we're not. Great. So um, very quickly before we move on to the harmony aspect, um, let's just think about the melody and the the range of the melody and the, the, where the notes are moving to. I think that's a really important thing to kind of be aware of when you're coming, coming up with your own ideas. Um, so 
for the purposes of, of this example, let's call the note that we start on, let's call that our tonic note, our kind of like key note, center note. So that's on our C, starting on concert C. And then we move up to our A flat. Okay, so here we're moving up at a sixth, basically. If we were thinking about being in the key of C minor, we're kind of going from our C to our A flat, which is automatically, it's a really melodic jump. Anything that uses thick sixths or ninths or thirds, it's all, it has that kind of natural melodic beauty to it. Um, and then we drop down to the fifth. And obviously, you know, as I'm sure you're aware, there's such a strong relationship between the, the, the five and the one. There's like a natural pull there. So that already that's got a really nice shape to it. It's interesting that if we change the order of the notes radically, we kind of lose a bit of that melodic aspect. You know, we could start on the C and then move to the, the third uh, and then to the B flat, A flat. It's interesting, but it's not necessarily got that same lilt and shape. It's that same contour that we had before. It feels like you could sing that. And that's one of the really important things about coming up with a, a great melody. And if you think about a lot of the great melodies from other songs, whether they're jazz standards, pop songs, rock songs, power ballads, whatever, it's all about that singability. And generally, like most people struggle to sing things with a massive gap in it. So if I kind of go... It's a, that's, it sounds quite jarring, and it's actually quite difficult to sing. But, you know, if I move up in something which is a bit closer, things move by step or by fourths, fifths, etc. It becomes a lot more pleasing to the ear, a lot kind of more a softer and more natural sound to the melody. You might not want that. You might want something quite harsh and quite angular, but it's just important to be aware that your choice of the order of the notes is going to affect the overall kind of uh, mood of the composition. And this is where your taste level comes in, and this is where you say, oh, I like the sound of that. Oh, I'm not so into the sound of that. Oh, that's almost what I want, but not quite happy about that note. And sometimes, you know, we've obviously got our specific seven notes, but there's no harm in changing. Composition is about change and evolution, so don't be too hung up on keeping very strict with any of these rules. All these rules are here just to give a bit of guidance, you know, so, um, yeah. yeah. Awesome. Um, okay, so let's move on to harmony. Okay, mm -hmm. we talked a bit about the melody, and hopefully that's given you some ideas to create your own melody and develop it a little bit as well. So harmony is essentially um, adding notes, um, adding color to the melody that you already have, kind of fattening it up, so to speak, basically. Mm -hmm. um, so one thing that I like to do um, straight away when I've come up with a melody or I've been given an idea for a melody is to try and harmonize that and see where it takes me. Um, and I find the easiest way for me, certainly as a piano player, is to take each note uh, in turn and kind of experiment with different harmonic choices that will fit that note. So for example, we start with our, our C. And now I want to think about all of the different harmonic choices I can use which might contain that C within them. Um, obviously, it's, it's, it's hundreds and hundreds of choices, so I'm not going to go through all of them, but you know, automatically we, we, we understand that C major, any sort of C chord, C minor, C dominant, obviously is going to fit with a C in the melody note because that's just the, the basics of the mechanics of, of music harmony. But where else can we move from there? So we can kind of just pick and choose, really. We can move through by step. I know that my C also fits into a D minor chord, for example. So now my C um, becomes the seventh of that D minor chord. Um, and it's, you can hear there's a difference in feeling, a difference in mood between this and 
I'll just play that melody note over the top so you sure. can hear the, the, it's like the note is here and the thing that's around it is shifting and changing. That's what Dave's doing. He's taking the same pivot point and he's giving it a different framework, you know. So if you've got a, in a, I know we were using the example of a portrait or a painting. If you've got your subject to person and you put them behind Symphony Hall, of course they're going to look amazing. But if you put them behind, I don't know, uh, kind of a, a dark alley, it's going to give them a different kind of mood. So we've got lots of different options to play with here. So this is a melody note. Great. That's quite nice on its own, and you uh, find these little yeah. gems in there. I was just thinking that, you know, mm. that that could easily find its way into our finished composition. Um, so that was obviously, we didn't really um, travel very far. You know, we kind of moved up by step. We took our C, uh, C minor, and we moved up a whole tone to D minor. But we could be a bit more radical with it and just experiment. So maybe if Sosa plays the, the C, the melody note, and I'm going to just move around different chords. They all naturally contain that C and just see, see what happens, see if I find anything beautiful. Mm -hmm. So that one note, one melody note, some experimentation with chords, and already that I feel like that could be part of a really meaningful part of a whole composition. Uh, some of the chords that I use there, just for your information, if you want to kind of experiment with that yourself, is um, I move to A flat major, so A flat major seven. <laughs> G minor in there. Uh, D flat major. B flat major. F major. So we got like a wealth of color there experimentation. Great. So um, maybe let's, for the purposes of moving on, let's just pick a couple of those chords and then we'll try and put them into a, a sequence and then we'll move on to discuss rhythm. Mm -hmm. Yeah? Yeah. So are there any, any of those ones that you particularly enjoyed, though, sir? <sighs> to be honest, exactly what you played. <laughs> <laughs> Sometimes you, um, by, by chance or by ear, you know, from having shedded this, you kind of stumble across that you know that beautiful thing the first time around sometimes it doesn't work that well and you have to rejig and stuff but i'm really i think that's a great sound man. i'm really into the whole of it yeah great mm -hmm. so how about this how about we take our original original idea when we were messing around with the the c and our two chords mm -hmm. that little pivot between the c uh, minor and the d minor mm -hmm. so we've got our uh, two chords And that can be can go around as many times as you feel is appropriate for that to go around. Mm -hmm. uh, and then we'll move into a second section where we just kind of push the harmony out a little bit further. So then we're looking at some of those chords that we introduced just now, the A flat major, the G minor. Then perhaps our B flat major. F. And then we can go back to our C and D. Yeah. It might be nice to... Um, I'm just thinking about how these things fit together, these builder blocks fit together, and there's an opportunity when you go to your A flat 
um, mm -hmm. G minor mm -hmm. to incorporate the next two notes of the melody as oh, well. Oh, great. So we can kind of pedal that. Pedal is where you sustain the same note throughout, so I'm going to hold that C for a long time. And when Dave goes to, is it is A flat major? That's right, A major. flat major and G minor, yeah. And G minor, I'm going to play the second two notes of the melody. Sorry, the second and third notes of the melody, and then I'm going to come back to the to the home note, you know. Perfect. Do you want to go from So if the you just give me a, when we're going okay, to the A sure, flat. Sure, sure, sure. <laughs> okay. Brilliant. Three, four. <laughs> enjoyed that yeah same. so um with not uh, a great deal of kind of like hard labor we've kind of come up with you know a really solid interesting idea uh, i'm sure there's like there's a bunch of stuff we can do with that there's more ways we can kind of manipulate it and we can stretch it and we can experiment further it might be too um sweet too soft for our taste maybe maybe we want it to make it grittier Maybe it needs more energy. Maybe it needs more space. These are all things that you yourself will kind of like feel naturally in relation to the to the composition. And it's all about your your personal choices and what the piece means to you and what you're trying to do with the piece. But you can see we've taken a relatively small amount of information. You know, a seven note melody, of which we've only used a few of those notes so far, and um, we've got you know we've found some harmony that fits and it works well. Okay, and we've come up with a structure. Naturally, we kind of fell into a rhythm there. We haven't talked about rhythm mm -hmm. as of yet, but we kind of fell into a rhythm there. We were playing in 4-4 in, in four, four, um, and just kind of moving just really kind of naturally, okay, between uh, sets of, of, of two chords, basically. So kind of two beats uh, on each chord, really, you know, depending on how you're counting it through. Um, but perhaps we could try playing it in a, a different time signature, mm -hmm. just for example, just to see how that works, keeping our same kind of core information and just changing the, the time feel and the time signature to see if that adds anything or, it, or it's a, a more interesting way to go. Should we just do that first one one more time and I'll kind of count out the beats so that sure, we can yeah, hear yeah, that, yeah. that fall and no, then we'll no. really hear the difference when we try it in a different one. Cool. Three. So it resets after every four. much a feeling for me and it's good to think about how your how your music makes you feel this makes me feel we're in a home and we go out for a little bit of a journey because you know we go a little bit further away from the home key the tonic 
we still play that note, but harmonically we're in a, entering a different zone. We're framing it in a different way, and then we come right back on home, which is really, really nice feeling. So yeah, awesome. Um, so let's should we try and maybe mess around with the uh, the time feel and the time signature? Mm -hmm. um, what do you think? Like three or five or? I thought we could even try because at the moment we're doing one chord and the other chord. One mm -hmm. chord. I wondered if we could do one chord, then change one chord, then change. Okay. So we're still keeping the same time, but we're just going to shift where which which beat we put it on. So at the moment we're putting it on beats one and three. Mm -hmm. Maybe we can try one and four. You know? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So we got our same same information, just changing the kind of harmonic um, rhythm of it, basically. Um, so. You want to put the emphasis on beats um, one and four. The change on the fourth beat. Yeah. Okay. One, two, So the chord lasts for three beats. Oh, okay. And then, and then yeah. so it's just the uh, one beat on the mm, on the second chord. On the second chord. chord. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Cool. Let's try that. One, two, three. I thought that worked well for the second set of chords. Yeah. The first set of chords, I think it was better when there was that equal balance, you know. Yeah. I mean, again, again this is just a matter of, of personal taste. You mm. might be hearing this and thinking, yeah, I really like that, or I preferred it when it was a certain way, or you might have your own ideas, mm -hmm. and hopefully you do, you know, um, of, of playing around with it and how you could shape and stretch that. What was interesting to me was that when we, um, we used Sosa's idea there of... Um, accenting the, the fourth beat, so changing the chord in the fourth beat, that automatically made it feel a bit like a folk song to me. Mm. That kind of gave it more of a kind of a, I want to find a better word than folky, but kind of like, like a, a bit real of a rustic push, isn't it? kind yeah. of like, yeah. yeah, I don't know. More of like a dance feel almost. Gives it like a sense of purpose, like a bit of a drive to it. Like we're kind of marching, walking. It's like a journey. Mm. We're kind of taking steps. So mm. these are all things just to bear in mind when you're coming up with the ways of, of manipulating the material. Mm. What about if we try it in a different time signature now, just, just for the sake of yeah. seeing what that sounds like? Yeah. Uh, what do you suggest? You got you. <laughs> I've had my suggestion. It's your time to shine, my God. Let's try um, five. Mm -hmm. Okay, so we're going to have five beats in the bar. Now, the good thing about, or well, the interesting thing about five is that it gives you a lot of opportunities to break up the bar in different ways. So just kind of doing the same exercise that we've been talking about, we could break up the bar with three beats on the first chord, two beats on the second, or we could reverse it. You could have two beats on the first chord and then three on the second, mm -hmm. four and one, one and four, mm -hmm. you know, or obviously if you're a bit more advanced, you can play around with like syncopation and perhaps two and a half beats or, mm -hmm. you know, things like this. But um, it just depends on, uh, again, what feels right. But let's keep it quite simple for now. Let's try three and two. Mm -hmm. So we'll do three beats on the first chord, two beats on the second. Should we try and ch change the tempo as yeah, well? Yeah, I was just thinking yeah. that maybe it's a little bit up, a bit yeah, faster perhaps. Yeah, that'd be nice, yeah. 
Yeah, okay, cool, yeah. Let's try that. Uh, two, three, two, two. That's a roast, man. I'm trying to count yeah. everything. It's an absolute roast. It's had a lot of, um, of energy, though. Yeah, That's I nice. love it that. Kinda... I love that. It really brings it to life for me, that does. Do you, how about if we do that same thing again, and then if you maybe experiment with playing the melody mm -hmm. over that, and if yeah, you want to have a little bit it. of uh, improvisation as well? Mm. So you've got D minor, C minor. Yeah, so C and D, yeah. uh, A flat and G minor, yeah. and then B flat and F major, B flat major and F major. Cool, cool. So yeah, we're just gonna try trial and error, see what happens, but it's good to play around. Uh, I, personally, I love to um, improvise whilst I'm composing. I feel like that gives me a sense of where the piece might end or, or where it might move to. Mm -hmm. um, and it helps to kind of piece things together and it helps to give me a sense of the kind of natural flow and, and energy of the piece, just to try and improvise, see if I can improvise around different sections of it and see if it feels like, uh, just feels right or whether it feels overcomplicated, basically. Mm. Um, so yeah, let's give that a little go. Okay. One, two, three, so <laughs> So there's some notes. So there was some. I was trying to experiment with using the, you know, the notes we use for the melody, over those different chords, and I, I kind of went a bit by trial and error. There was sometimes I was like, oh, I wasn't expecting yeah. that sound, but there was sometimes where it really worked very well. So, um, so yeah, that's you know, it's, it's, it is about just piece, piecing these bits, bits of a jigsaw kind of together, and and then you could kind of take them apart and stuff. So yeah, that works though, man. I'm really into that. That's nice. We had a little playthrough, uh, and we liked what we heard. Uh, some of the ideas felt like really solid. Um, I still feel like there's a lot we could do with that as well. Um, so we've talked about melody, harmony, rhythm. Um, let's talk about structure a little bit as well. So we kind of came up with a the structure then sort of uh, organically as we were discussing the piece anyway. Uh, we've got um, essentially three different sets of chords and moving through them, uh, spending a certain amount of time on each, on each chord pairing. Um, we could think about it a bit more in terms of the overall shape of the piece, so maybe we want an introduction, and maybe we want a way to end it, um, and then we want something to happen in the middle. That's like this really super simple, basic way of thinking about structure. Your structure can be as simple or as complex as you feel like you need it to be. You can move back and forth between sections. You can leave room in the piece for an undefined structure. If you're working with a band and improvisers, you can deliberately leave room in the piece for something to happen which you haven't prepared or pre-planned. But for now, what we'll do is we'll kind of come up with like an introduction, then we'll move through our piece, our chord pairings, as we've kind of been talking about, and we'll have a little section where 
Zosa can improvise. Mm -hmm. uh, or we can just have an improv improvisation section generally, uh, where, the, where we can, the two of us can improvise over the, the piece. And then we'll think about how we want to end it, so like a really kind of um, definitive ending, just to kind of round it up and give us like a basic kind of skeleton, mm -hmm. skeleton form. Mm -hmm. Okay, so um, how about as an introduction, we keep it out of tempo. So we won't, we won't set the, the tempo or the time field to begin with. We'll keep it free, and we'll use the melody notes that we've mm -hmm. come up with, our seven-note mm -hmm. melody. We'll just explore those, and we'll interact with each other, and then I'll gradually bring in the time feel for those chord pairings. And then just, just, just for my sake, in terms of the structure or the form of our little loop that we've got, yep. it goes D and C, mm -hmm. and then B flat and A uh, minor. A, a flat and G. A flat and G minor, yeah. sorry. And then... Then B flat and B F. Flat, B flat and what? Uh, an F major. B an flat F major. major. And then back, back to, to D, the C and, and D. And then to the top. Okay, cool. So we can, in fact, we could do what's called um, an ABA form, just to kind of to demonstrate this. So we'll... We'll start with our relatively free kind of melodic introduction using the melody notes. We'll call that our A section. Then we'll move into our chord pairings, the B. So we're moving through our different harmonic choices uh, with a bit of improvisation. We'll just improvise throughout that. Mm -hmm. And then we'll finish up, uh, we'll go back to the, uh, the melody notes that we started with. Mm -hmm. And then nice. so we're kind of doing like a, an ABA shape. Mm -hmm. Yeah, let's give that a go. So yeah, there you have it, mm -hmm. a composition. Mm -hmm. um, you know, you can take your composition as, as far as you want to. You know, you can, it might be finished after 10 minutes. It might never be finished. You know, it might be 10 weeks or you might come back to it in 10 years and, and develop it further. Um, certainly, I remember um, Dave Holland, um, a great bass player, com composer, um, with a, a workshop with him in which somebody asked a question, you know, when do you feel like your composition is finished? And um, his answer was, was that it's, it's never finished. It's never, 
truly complete, and that's the joy of composition, that unlike a painting, you know, you can keep adding and taking away and re reshaping it and, and everything else. You know, you can, you can always develop, as you develop as a, as a person and as a musician, you can return to that composition and you might feel you want to play it in a different way. You might want to change something with a different lineup, different instrumentation, or just change the whole feel of it altogether. But there's always room for you to kind of organically shape that um, depending on what you want, um, what you want to achieve from it. Mm. And just to reiterate the point as well, that not every composition has to be a masterpiece. We learn a lot. I mean, I've learned a lot today just through the process of kind of trying to develop this. And I've learned a little bit about some scales. I've learned a little bit about some chords through experimentation. So composition is a learning tool as much as it is, you know, for its own sake. So I think yeah. just get get stuck in, get dive in, you know, dive in and just experiment and see and see what comes out. You know what I mean? That's the it's, it's really a learn by doing thing, so don't worry too much about too many rules. But these, you know, what we've presented are just some options and ideas for you to take and experiment with. Yeah, awesome. Um, so we'll just finish up by talking about how you might want to look at adding kind of more detail, a bit more color, a bit more body to your composition, especially if you're someone that's already. Um, experienced in on composition, you've tried to compose things before, you've had a go at it, you, you understand the process, but you want to find ways to kind of just um, kind of improve or embellish your, your composition and, and, and just change it around, change it up a little bit. Um, some of the things that I've, I've written down that spring to mind when I'm thinking about writing my own music is um, variety, you know, how I can vary the, the written material, take the same kind of basic idea and, and reshape it. I also like to think about the transitions between different sections of music. Um, in our case, we, you know, we had three clear, distinct sections, uh, an ABA form, but there's different ways we can move between the A and the B. Uh, we could set something, we could write a little figure or a little device to take us there. Um, Currently, we're both, both playing at the same time all the time. Mm -hmm. That doesn't have to be the case. There could be a bit where Zosa plays by himself uh, uh, or where I play by myself and then Zosa joins in. You know, we can play around with the texture. So yeah, texture is another one of those things that we can, we can look at, uh, especially when you're working in a full band situation or if you're scoring, if you're working on a computer at home and you're using production software, texture is a big thing in terms of like adding variety and adding interest to your piece. Um, we talked a bit about the shape, you know, where we're starting from, where we want to end up. And that also links quite directly into the intensity of the piece. So we haven't talked much about dynamics. We, we, you know, we use dynamics in the piece when we just tried to play through there. Sort of naturally, we just fell into like a um, dynamic kind of like range, but um, we didn't set that specifically, but we could do. We could say that we're going to start off really loud, really heavy, using the, um, the lower ranges of our instruments. So we're looking at texture and dynamics there. Mm -hmm. And then we can move into that middle section. It could be lighter, it could have more space, it could be cleaner, mm -hmm. and it could be quieter. So these are all things that you can play around with. Um, so yeah, definitely bear those things in mind. Maybe write a list. And when you're coming up with your own composition, just refer to that list. Every time you come up with a new idea or you're a bit stuck, maybe refer to that list and think, OK, what can I use from here to kind of just add some interest and just move forward in the piece, kind of add some interest for the listener and interest for myself as the composer. Mm -hmm. um, should we have one final play through and maybe look at introducing some of those elements? Yeah, yeah definitely. Yeah. So um, I think maybe let's look at a texture, and, and Zosa could, could start, I think. Mm -hmm. So rather than starting together, Zosa can start. And then where do you feel it might, it might move from there? Mm, well, I think, I think we could keep it, especially when we play the first melody round, very, you know, it's, it's, got, a, it's got a capacity to travel a long way to get very intense. So we don't want to over over gas it before we've before we've got there. So I think we should keep it. 
I'll start and keep the intensity quite down and, and, and soft and subtle. Mm -hmm. And then you come in, sneak in, you know what I mean? We can yeah. kind of crescendo in. And then as we get through to, you know, the second time around the melody, Mm -hmm. into the more improv we can go really go ham on it and then uh -huh. and then again like a wave so we're kind of following the shape of the melody in a way you know we're kind of starting so, you know subtle and then mm -hmm. going up and then coming down i like that um and how about one extra thing we could add in as well just to experiment when we start off we can play our melody when you begin perhaps in the in the bottom range of your instrument mm -hmm. keep it quite um earthy yeah. quite quite you know uh, likewise, when I creep in, I'm going to stay in the, sort of the bottom half of the piano. Okay. When we return to the melody after the improv section, okay. the second day, perhaps we'll switch up and we can hit the, the high octaves. Yeah, that and that could be like a clean ending. Mm -hmm. yeah. So A section and then three B sections. Um, no, so A section, one B, B section is just through, as is. Mm. The, the, the chord pairings, mm -hmm. so the three different chord pairings. Mm -hmm. Is that what you meant? Or and no. then do we go back and then to, back the, to a? the A? Yeah, yeah. Okay, so just once. Just that's right. Yeah, yeah. Okay, cool. But when we hit the A and the second time we're playing it up, the oh, okay, makes sense. Yep, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Awesome. Okay, let's see. Let's see what happens. Like I said, trial and error. There's no wrong or right. Like something might happen now, and often, in fact, when I write, like I say, I like to play through sections a little bit, try and improvise. Often I'll make a mistake. And that mistake ends up being something that actually makes the whole piece, and mm. it's really quite exciting. So, yeah. <laughs> Mm-hmm. <laughs> 